Chapter 2 Remote View of the Ascetic Planet Nietzsche's Antiquity Project The term Late Renaissance, which I have suggested to characterise the still inadequately understood sport cult phenomenon that appeared after 1900, proves helpful in dating Nietzsche's intervention in the midst of the discourses of the Enlightenment as it changed into modernity. In truth, any attempt to understand Nietzsche must begin with a reflection on his date. With this thinker, it is not sufficient to cast a glance at his dates of birth and death in order to know when he was living and thinking. One of the enormities of this author is the impossibility of identifying him as a child of his time. Naturally, it's easy to point to the aspects of his work that are typical of the time. One can show how, as an artist, he made the transition from Biedermeyer weakened romanticism to a late romantically tinged modernity. As a publicist, the leap from Wagnerism to a prophetic elitism. As a thinker, the change of position from symbolist late idealism to perspectival naturalism. Or expressed in names, from Schopenhauer to Darwin. If only the aspects of Nietzsche that were indebted to his epoch were significant, the reception of his work would not have lasted beyond 1914. The turning point from which the moderns once and for all had other concerns, and as early as 1927, Heidegger was already elevating these other concerns to the level of concern, Zorge, itself. Concern sans phrase. In truth, Nietzsche's impulses only began to unfold in that age of other concerns, and there is no end to this work of unfolding in sight. The author of The Genealogy of Morals is the most philosophically observant contemporary of the processes referred to with the concept of the somatic or athletic renaissance introduced above. In order to gain a suitable idea of their thrust and their pull, it is indispensable to reread his writings on the art of living, which pose the question of the true date of Nietzsche's intellectual existence for strong objective reasons. One can believe without further investigation the claim that the author occasionally thought of himself as someone from the Renaissance who had ended up in the wrong period. What is relevant in our context is not the sense of an elective past, or some homesickness for a bygone golden age for art and uncompromising methods. The decisive aspect is rather the fact that Nietzsche was himself an actor in a genuine renaissance, and that the only reason he did not identify himself accordingly is that his notion of renaissance was too dependent on art historical conventions. It is not for nothing that the young Nietzsche was one of the most intensive readers of Jacob Berthardt's epoch morphological masterpiece, Die Culture de Renaissance in Italienne, 1860, a work in which the historian gathered together several centuries' worth of culture to form a single giant mural. Stepping back from this huge picture, the art recipient of the late 19th century had no choice but to long for times past and project himself into a suitable part of the painting. Everything suggests that Nietzsche was no stranger to such exercises. He may have transported himself to the army camp of Castruccio Castracciani to experience heroic vitalism up close, or gone for a walk along the Lungo to Vera, dreaming of becoming a César Borgia of philosophy. Nonetheless, it would have sufficed for the wanderer of Sils Maria to abandon the art-historically confined notion of Renaissance and advance to a process-theoretical one. Then he would inevitably have reached the conclusion of the, that the age of rebirth, quote-unquote, had by no means ended with the artistic and cultural events of the 15th and 16th centuries. From a processual perspective, Nietzsche would have recognised himself at the current pivot of an advancing renaissance, 
that was in the process of outgrowing its educated middle-class definitions. Via the mediation of the Enlightenment, this movement had changed from a hobby among a tiny literate elite and their secretaries, an ostentatious amusement among princely and mercantile art patrons and their masterly suppliers, who established a first quote-unquote art system, into a national, a European, indeed a planetary matter. In order to spread from the few to the many, the Renaissance had to discard its humanistic exterior and reveal itself as the return of ancient mass culture. The true Renaissance question, reformulated in the terminology of practical philosophy, namely whether other forms of life are possible and permissible for us alongside and after Christianity, especially ones whose patterns are derived from Greek and Roman, or perhaps even Egyptian or Indian, antiquity, was no longer a secret discourse or an academic exercise in the 19th century, but rather an epochal fa- passion, an inescapable pro nobis. Hence one must be aware of the false conclusion that the topic of the life reform, which was in the air from the Romantics and early socialists on, thought it only reached its charismatic peak after 1900, was a mere sectarian quirk, with the reform houses as an endearingly old-fashioned relic. The life reform is rather the Renaissance program itself, transferred from bourgeois art history to the arena of battles for the true modus vivendi of the moderns. Placing Nietzsche in this arena means dating him correctly, for the time being. The expansion of the Renaissance zone is no more than a first step, however. If one left it at that, one would only have redated Nietzsche semi-correctly at best. One would certainly have done him justice by assimilating his present into a past of his choosing. As far as his more radical chronopolitics is concerned, however, his striving to break out of the modern age as such, one would not really be taking him seriously. This attempt to break out is what holds the far greater provocation and the far more potent food for thought. Dealing with it also demands more than the re-dating suggestion that has been common for some time, which posits that Nietzsche belongs not to modernity, but to post-modernity as one of its founding fathers. Well, Nietzsche's position cannot be defined in terms of a choice between modern and postmodern. In fact, it does not even show up on this field. Nietzsche's departure to a period that suited him did not, as some would have it, take him into an era, quote unquote, after modernity, whatever that word might mean. What he envisaged was not a modernization of modernity, no progress beyond the time of progress. And nor did he by any means break up the one historical narrative into several, as seemed plausible to critical minds working on the self-investigation of the Enlightenment during the late 20th century. Nietzsche was concerned with a radical allochrony, a fundamental other timeliness in the midst of the present. His true date is, therefore, antiquity. And because antiquity can only exist in modern times as repetition, neo-antiquity. The neo-ancient antiquity in which Nietzsche locates himself is not meant as a mere program, something that could be placed on the agenda to meet the needs of today. An arranged antiquity would go against Nietzsche's intentions, as its reservation on the daily agenda would itself be an unwelcome act of modernism. Agendas provide the forms of work that modernity uses to arrange its steps on the timeline to the future, whether one interprets them as a meaningful or empty forward motion. What Nietzsche had in mind was not a repetition of ancient patterns on the model of fashion, whose antiquity is never more than a few years ago. The question of whether fashions rotate in decades or millennia was of no consequence to him. His concept of allochrony, initially introduced shyly as untimeliness, 
then later radicalized to an exit from modernity is based on the idea as suggestive as it is fantastic that antiquity has no need of repetitions enacted in subsequent periods because it essentially returns constantly on its own strength in other words antiquity or the ancient is not an overcome phase of cultural development that is only represented in the collective memory and can be summoned by the willfulness of education it is rather a kind of constant present a depth time a nature time a time of being that continues underneath the theater of memory and innovation that occupies cultural time if one could show how recurrence defeats repetition and the circle makes a fool of the line this would not only demonstrate an understanding of the point of Nietzsche's decisive self-dating, it would also fulfill the precondition for any judgment on whether, and in what sense, Nietzsche is our contemporary, and whether, and to what extent, we are, or wish to be, his contemporaries. This much should be clear by now. The term Renaissance can only remain fruitful and demanding as long as it refers to a far-reaching idea that it is the fate of Europeans to develop life and forms of life according to and alongside the Christian definitions of life and forms of life. From Nietzsche's perspective, it is not a matter of imitating ancient patterns, but rather before all revivals of specific content, of revealing antiquity as a mode of non-historical, non-forward-directed, non-progressive time. This calls for no less than the suspension of Christian cultural time, whether it is envisaged as an apocalyptic acceleration of the end, or a patient pilgrimage through the world, or as a church-politically prudent combination of both modes. It goes without saying that enlightened cultural time, the time of progress, and the time of capital are also affected by this suspension. Only in this context is there any point in re-examining Nietzsche's overexcited confrontation of Christianity. From today's perspective, it is a somewhat unpleasant chapter to which one only returns because the reasons for doing so are stronger than the reservations. One could pass over it as an episode of fin de cycle neurosis, not least out of sympathy for the author, were it not simultaneously the vehicle for Nietzsche's most valuable and enduring insights. The anti-Christian polemic shows its productive side if one transfers it to the context of Nietzsche's antiquity project, which, as we have seen, is devoted to a regeneratively intended return to the pre-Christian era and hence an emancipation from the schema antiquity, middle ages, modern age. Excuse me. An emancipation from the schema, antiquity, middle ages, modern age. Wanting to go back to a time before Christianity here means situating oneself prior to a modus vivendi, whose binding nature has meanwhile been undone, and now only seems effective in inauthentic adaptations, culturally Christian translations, and pity ethical, as well as pity polit political, including self-pity political, restylizations. In leaping back to before the cultural period of Christianity, he is by no means espousing its humanistic reform. This had been the program of compromise in modern age Europe, which created the enormous hybrid of quote-unquote Christian humanism through centuries of literary, pedagogical and philanthropic work, from Erasmus to T.S. Eliot, from Comenius to Montessori, and from Ignatius to Albert Schweitzer. What occupies him does not concern the conditions of the possibility of an amalgam, but rather the preconditions for a radical break with the system of half-measures. In Nietzsche's usage, the word Christianity 
does not even refer primarily to the religion, using it like a code word. He is thinking more of a particular religio-metaphysically influenced disposition, an ascetically, in the penitent and self-denying sense, defined attitude to the world, an unfortunate form of life deferral, focus on the hereafter and quarrel with secular facts. In The Antichrist, Nietzsche inveighed against all this with the fury of a man who wanted to bring the pillars of the Western religious tradition, and hence also of his own existence, crashing down. All this can be used to support my thesis, which connects these reflections to the subject of the book. In his role as the protagonist and medium of a differently understood antiquity, Nietzsche becomes the discoverer of ascetic cultures in their immeasurable historical extension. Here it is relevant to observe that the word ascesis, alongside the word malaleta, which is also the name of a muse, simply means exercise or training in ancient Greek. In the wake of his new division of ascetic opinion, Nietzsche not only stumbles upon the fundamental meaning of the practicing life, for the development of styles of existence or quote-unquote cultures. He puts his finger on what he sees as the decisive separation for all moralities, namely, into the asceticisms of the healthy and those of the sick, though he does not show any reservations about presenting the antithesis with an almost caricatural harshness. The healthy, a word that has long been subjected to countless deconstructions, are those who because they are healthy, want to grow through good asceticisms. And the sick are those who, because they are sick, plot revenge against bad asceticisms. This can only be called a hair-raising simplification of the situation. Nonetheless, one has to admit, hammering home these arguments does bring something to light that must be acknowledged as one of the great discoveries of intellectual history. Nietzsche is no more or less than the Schliemann of asceticisms. In the midst of the excavation sites, surrounded by the psychopathic rubble of millennia and the ruins of morbid palaces, he was completely right to assume the triumphant expression of a discoverer. We know today that he had dug in the right place. What he dug up, however, to continue the metaphor, was not Homer's Troy, but a later layer, and a large number of the asceticisms to which he referred polemically were precisely not expressions of life denial and metaphysical servility. It was rather a matter of heroism in a spiritual disguise. Nietzsche's occasional misinterpretations cannot detract from the value of his discovery. With his find, Nietzsche stands fatally, in the best sense of the word, at the start of modern non-spiritualistic acetologies, along with their physio- and psychotechnic annexes. With dietologies and self-referential trainings, and hence all the forms of self-referential practicing and working on one's own vital form that I bring together in the term anthropotechnics. The significance of the impulse coming from Nietzsche's new view of ascetic phenomena can hardly be overestimated. By shifting himself to a supra-epochal antiquity that waits beneath every medieval and modern non-antiquity, and under every future, he attained the necessary level of eccentricity to cast a glance, as if from without, at his own time and others. His alternative self-dating allowed him to leap out of the present, giving him the necessary eyesight to encompass the continuum of advanced civilizations, the 3,000-year empire of mental exercises, self-trainings, self-elevations, and self-lowerings. In short, the universe of metaphysically coded vertical tension in an unprecedented synopsis. Here we should quote especially those sections from Nietzsche's central morality-critical work, The Genealogy of Morals, that deal with their subject in a diction of Olympian clarity. 
In the decisive passage, he discusses the practice forms of that life denial or world weariness, which, according to Nietzsche, exemplifies the morphological circle of sick asceticisms in general. Quote, the ascetic of the priestly sick type treats life as a wrong path on which one must walk backwards till one comes to the place where it starts, or he treats it as an error which one may, nay, must refute by action, for he demands that he should be followed. He enforces where he can his valuation of existence. What does this mean? Such a monstrous valuation is not an exceptional care or a curiosity recorded in human history. It is one of the broadest and longest facts that exist. Reading from the vantage point of a distant star, the capital letters of our earthly life would perchance lead to the conclusion that the earth was a truly ascetic planet, a den of discontented, arrogant and repulsive creatures who never got rid of a deep disgust of themselves of the world, of all life, and did themselves as much hurt as possible out of pleasure and hurting, presumably their one and only pleasure. End quote. With this note, Nietzsche presents himself as the pioneer of a new human science, that one could describe as a planetary science of culture. Its method consists in observing our heavenly body, using photographs of cultural formations as if from a great altitude. Through the new image-producing abstractions, the life of the earthlings has searched for more general patterns, with asceticism coming to light as a historically developed structure that Nietzsche quite legitimately calls one of the broadest and longest facts that exist. These facts demand a suitable cartography and a corresponding geography in basic science. That is all the genealogy of morals seeks to be. The new science of the origins of moral systems, and AO Ipso, of morally governed forms of life and practice. It is the first manifestation of general acetology. It begins the explication history of religions and systems of ethics as anthropotechnic praxis. We must not let ourselves be distracted by the fact that in this passage, Nietzsche is referring exclusively to the asceticisms of the sick and their priestly minders. The ascetic planet he cites is the planet of the practicing as a whole, the planet of advanced civilized humans, the planet of those who have begun to give their existence forms and contents under vertical tensions in countless programs of effort, some more and some less strictly coded. When Nietzsche speaks of the ascetic planet, it is not because he would rather have been born on a more relaxed star. His antiquity instinct tells him that every heavenly body worth inhabiting must, correctly understood, be an ascetic planet inhabited by the practicing, the aspiring, and the virtuosos. What is antiquity for him but the code word for the age in which humans had to become strong enough for a sacred imperial image of the whole? Inherent in the great worldviews of antiquity was the intention of showing mortals how they could live in harmony with the universe, even and especially when that whole showed them its baffling side, its lack of consideration for individuals. What one called the wisdom of the ancients was essentially a tragic holism, a self-integration within the great whole that could not be achieved without heroism. Nietzsche's planet would become the place whose inhabitants, especially the male ones, would carry the weight of that world anew without self-pity. In keeping with the Stoic maxim that the only important thing is to keep oneself in shape for the cosmos. Some of this appeared not much later in Heidegger's Doctrine of Concern, at whose call mortals must adjust to the burden character of design. After 1918, the mortals were primarily the wounded and non-fallen, who were meant to keep themselves ready for other forms of death on other fronts. Nietzsche 
Under no circumstances could the Earth remain an institution in which the resentment programs of the sick and the compensation-claiming skills of the insulted determined the climate. In his differentiation between asceticisms, Nietzsche posited a clear divide between the priestly varieties on the one side, illuminated by his vicious gaze, and the disciplinary rules of intellectual workers, philosophers and artists, as well as the exercises of warriors and athletes on the other side. If the former are concerned with what one might call a pathological asceticism, an artful self-violation among an elite of sufferers that empowers them to lead other sufferers and induce the healthy to become co-sick. The latter only impose their regulations on themselves because they see them as a means of reaching their optimum as thinkers and creators of works. What Nietzsche calls the pathos of distance is devoted entirely into the division of asceticisms. Its intention is to keep the missions separate and set the exercises whereby those who are successful, good and healthy can become more successful, good and healthy apart from those which enable resolute failures, the malicious and the sick to place themselves on pedestals and pulpits, whether for the sake of perversely acquired feelings of superiority or to distract themselves from their tormenting interest in their own sickness and failure. Needless to say, the opposition of healthy and sick should not be taken as purely medical. It serves as the central distinction in an ethics that gives a life with the first movement. Quoting from Thus Spoke Zarathustra, be a self-propelling wheel. Priority over a life dominated by inhibited movement. I'll read that sentence again without the parenthesis. It serves as the central distinction in an ethics that gives a life with the first movement priority over a life dominated by inhibited movement. The extension of the moral historical perspective makes the meaning of the thesis of the athletic and somatic renaissance apparent. At the transition from the 19th to the 20th century, the phenomenon labelled the rebirth of antiquity in language regulations of art history entered a phase that fundamentally modified the motives of our identification with cultural relics from antiquity, even from the early classical period. Here, as we have seen, one finds a regression to a time in which the changing of life had not yet fallen under the command of life-denying asceticisms. This supra-epochal time could just as easily be called the future, and what seems like a regression towards it could also be conceived of as a leap forwards. The manner in which Rilke experienced the torso of Apollo testified to the same cultural shift that Nietzsche was pursuing when he pushed his reflections on the establishment of the priestly bio-negative spiritualistic asceticisms to the point where the paradoxical struggle of the suffering life against itself became apparent. In discovering the ascetological foundations of higher human forms of life, he assigned a new meaning to morality. The power of the practice layer in human behaviour is sufficiently broad to span the contrast between affirmative and denying moralities. Let us emphasise once again. The disclosure of one of the broadest and longest facts that exist concerns not only the self-tormenting approaches to shaping one's self-dealings, it encompasses all varieties of concern for oneself, as well as all forms of concern for adaptation to the highest. Aside from that, the jurisdiction of ascetology, understood as a general theory of practicing, doctrine of habit, and germinal discipline of anthropotechnics, does not end with the phenomena of advanced civilization and the spectacular results of mental or somatic vertical ascent leading into the most diverse forms of virtuosity. It closes every vital continuum, every series of habits, every lived succession, including the seemingly most formless drifting, 
in the most advanced neglect and exhaustion. One cannot deny a marked one-sidedness in Nietzsche's late writings. He did not pursue the positive side of his ascetological discoveries with the same emphasis as that he displayed in his explorations of the morbid pole. Undoubtedly because of a stronger inclination toward examining the therapeutic purpose of negative ascetic ideals than the athletic, dietological, aesthetic, and also biopolitical purpose of positive practice programs. Throughout his life, he was sufficiently sick to be interested in possibilities of overcoming sickness in a meaningful way, and sufficiently lucid to reject the traditional attempts to bestow meaning upon the senseless. That is why he exhibited a combination of reluctant respect for the attainment of ascetic ideals in the history of mankind to date, and reluctant to draw on them himself. In Nietzsche's case, this fluctuation between an appreciation of self-coercive behaviour and scepticism towards the idealistic extravagances of such praxis led to a new attentiveness towards the behavioural area of asceticism, practice and self-treatment as a whole. It is the re-description of this in terms of a general theory of anthropotechnics that is now called for. There are three points to bear in mind that make the discovery of the ascetic planet as far-reaching as it is problematic. Firstly, Nietzsche's new view of the ascetic dimension only became possible in a time when the asceticisms were becoming post-spiritually somaticized, while the manifestations of spirituality were moving in a post-ascetic, non-disciplined and informal direction. The despiritualization of asceticisms is probably the event in the current intellectual history of mankind that is the most comprehensive, and, because of its large scale, the hardest to perceive. Yet at once the most palpable and atmospherically powerful. Its counterpart is the informalization of spirituality, accompanied by its commercialization in the corresponding subcultures. The threshold values for these two tendencies provide the intellectual landmarks for the 20th century. The first tendency is represented by sport, which has become a metaphor for achievement as such, and the second by a popular neo-mysticism, that devotio postmoderna, which covers the lives of contemporary individuals with unpredictable flashes of inner emergency. Secondly, on the ascetic planet, once discovered as such, the difference between those who make something or a great deal of themselves and those who make little or nothing of themselves becomes increasingly conspicuous. This is a difference that does not fit into any time or any ethics. In the monotheistic age, God was viewed as the one who causes and does everything, and hence humans were not entitled to make something, let alone a great deal, of themselves. In humanistic epochs, by contrast, man is considered the being responsible for causing and doing everything, but consequently no longer has the right to make little or nothing of himself. Whether people now make nothing or much of themselves, they commit, according to traditional forms of logic, an inexplicable and unpardonable error. There is always a surplus of differences that cannot be integrated into any of the prescribed systems of life interpretation. In a world that belongs to God, human beings make too much of themselves as soon as they raise their heads, in a world that belongs to humans, they repeatedly make too little of themselves. The possibility that the inequality between humans might be due to their asceticisms, their different starts towards the challenges of the practicing life, this idea has never been formulated in the history of investigations into the ultimate causes of differences between humans. If one follows this trail, it opens up perspectives that, being unthought of, are literally unheard of. And finally, if the athletic and somatic renaissance means that despiritualized asceticisms are once more possible, desirable, and vitally plausible, then Nietzsche's agitated question at the end of his text 
the genealogy of morals, namely, where human life can find its bearings after the twilight of the gods, effortlessly answers itself. Vitality, understood both somatically and mentally, is itself the medium that contains a gradient between more and less. It therefore contains the vertical component that guides ascents within itself, and has no need of additional external or metaphysical attractors. That God is supposedly dead is irrelevant in this context. With or without God, each person will only get as far as their own form carries them. Naturally, God, during the time of his effective cultural representation, was the most convincing attractor for those forms of life and practice which strove, quote-unquote, towards him. And this towards him was identical to upwards. Nietzsche's concern to preserve vertical tension after the death of God proves how seriously he took his task as the quote-unquote last metaphysician, without overlooking the comical aspect of his mission. He had found his great role as a witness to the vertical dimension without God. The fact that he did not have to fear any rivals during his lifetime confirms that his choice was right. His aim of keeping the space above the dead free was a passion that remained understandable to more than a few fellow sufferers in the 20th century. This accounts for the continued and infectious identification of many readers today with Nietzsche's existence and its unlivable contradictions. Here, for once, the epithet tragic is appropriate. The theomorphism of his inner life withstood his own exercises in god destruction the author of the gay science was aware of how pious even he still was at the same time he already understood the rules and force on the ascetic planet well enough to realize that all ascents start from the base camp of ordinary life his questions transcend but where to Ascend, but to what height, would have answered themselves if he had calmly kept both feet on the ascetic ground. He was too sick to follow his most important insight, that the main thing in life is to take the minor things seriously. When minor things grow stronger, the danger posed by the main thing is contained. Then, climbing higher in the minor things means advancing in the main thing.